worship of the emperor. What the emperor looked like before Horus decided to bitch slap him so hard he ended up spending the next 10,000 years on the golden throne as a rotting corpse. Notice the giant skull. How did that skull get so big? Is it a plastic faux skull? Or is it a mutant or even an alien skull? What he doesn't want you to know is that the E is actually a midget. The armor is a mech and that that's a regular sized skull balam anyway. Back to the topic at hand. You don't get to see the emperor out of armor very often. But he still looks fabulous without his armor. We believe in one lord. The emperor. The almighty. Ruler of heaven and earth. Of all that is. Seen and unseen. We believe in one lord. Emperor of mankind. The only lord of creation. Eternally begotten of humanity. Human from human. Light from light. True lord from true lord. Begotten. Not made. Of one being with humanity. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven. Was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and came among us. For our sake he has faced down chaos. He withstood death and was enthroned. To this day he lives on in accordance with the scriptures. He resides upon Mother Terra and is seated upon the throne of humanity. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Emperor, the Giver of Life, who proceeds from humanity and from Terra, who with humanity and upon Terra is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy true and divinely guided Ekelshiarchy. We acknowledge one path for the defense against chaos. We look for the justice for our dead, and the life of the worlds to come. Amen. The creed of the Mankind's Council of Nicene of Holy Terror Most Christian elegant TG gentlemen will recognize it as a bastardized version of the Apostles' Creed. Did Horus not say that you sought Godhood? He built a rebellion upon that claim. How he would gloat. To see the Imperium now. Rob out Gilliman. The Imperium advocates worship the Emperor as the one true God through the Imperial Creed. This creed is propagated and its adherence is enforced by the Adeptus Ministorum and the Inquisition. All citizens and fighters of the Imperium have little to no say about their choice in faith or lack thereof. They must worship the Emperor through the various Ministorum approved faiths throughout the galaxy due to varying cultures. Many planets have their own way of worshipping the Emperor, although these are heavily regulated by the Ministorum to weed out any heretical influences. There is no middle road or compromise that doesn't involve the apostate being on the receiving end of a state sponsor sponsored public lynching. Anyone who defies or deviates from the teachings of the imperial creed or even is just perceived to defy it, whether willingly or unwillingly after all, incompetence is inexcusable in the eyes of the emperor, is condemned as a heretic and is executed whether it's going to be fast or excruciatingly slow is dependent on the person judging the condemn. Even if someone hasn't disobeyed the imperial creed but is deemed to have will be treated as if they broke the creed. Forgiveness for one's sins is possible, although these cases are exorbitantly rare at least the one that doesn't end with the accused being condemned to a glorious death. And it usually is extremely painful. It doesn't help that some of the members of the Ekelshiarchy and Inquisition are so batchet insane that they are killing countless innocent followers of the Imperial Creed for no reason. Now, the only reason the Imperium worships the Emperor is that after his fight with Horus and his internment into the Golden Throne, they pretty much forgot what the Emperor taught them when he preached the Imperial Truth. Olympi did not actually tell anyone of the Chaos Gods, withholding the information even from the Primarchs in hopes of protecting them from corruption by hoping that ignorance is bliss. Unfortunately, this became part of why the Horus heresy happened in the first place. Some saw that the Emperor lied to them by holding the truth hidden. Some did not know how to handle the temptation the gods conveyed. Some did not even know that they were manipulated all this time and by whom. Some would try to seek out something to place their faith upon, not realizing what would needed to be done to become chosen in the eyes of the gods. Plus, it's pretty damn hard to fight against something if you don't know that it exists. The Horus Heresy novels also mentioned the Interrex, another atheist empire who understood that threat of chaos, but treated that information secularly and scientifically. They told every citizen everything that was known about chaos, and thus resisted the taint altogether which basically shows how ineffective the imperial truth really was and how much the emperor has screwed up in the emperor's long game. He knew that humanity was evolving into a psychic species with even more potential than the Elder. And look what happened to them. E-Money wanted mankind to be a utopia of science and reason, by eliminating religion and thus preventing the temptations of demons, controlling sickers and thus preventing random demonic possessions, and eliminating warp travel by creating the human webway and thus eliminating all human contact with chaos when traveling through the warp. He wanted to isolate humanity from the chaos gods, cause who gives a shit about the ruinous powers if they're stuck in the warp with no way of getting out. Regarding the religion angle the emperor very much realized that chaos runs off emotion. 
all everyday emotion, and not just worship. The stronger the emotions, the stronger the gods get, and the stronger the gods get, the easier it is to corrupt others. The problem with religion is that it allows too many avenues for demons to exploit. A whisper here and a miracle there, then you get people praying to them without even realizing it, then shortly afterwards you get a planet turned inside out by demons. His plan was not to starve the chaos gods of sustenance and ultimately defeat them, he knew it was impossible, his plan was just to prevent them from touching humanity ever again. However, he made a critical mistake in disregarding the human need to believe in something greater than oneself, and despite his best efforts, nothing was enough to fill the place of religion in human society. Ironically, the best solution would be not to suppress faith but to redirect it towards something else, but because of his natural awesomeness, unmatched psychic powers and enigmatic nature, that something else ended up being the emperor himself. After he went off being the most powerful psychic cucumber in the universe, and lost direct control of the Imperium, belief in him sort of helped the Imperium stand together against all odds, even if it basically dropped 99.9% .9 of humanity's IQ in the process. With the warp being what it is, the act of worshipping the Emperor supercharged his power in the Immaterium to the point of being truly godlike. Even while his body is still stuck in its current physical state of near death, the Imperium's faith in the Emperor is basically their biggest anchor of bravery and perseverance in a universe where humanity is constantly beset by unimaginably massive swarms of voracious space locusts who exist only to feed and multiply its biomass. Older than chaos itself zombie terminator robots set on culling all life from the galaxy, diabolical celestial beings literally as old as the stars, whose single desire is harvesting all living souls, a race of nigh unkillable barbarians, genetically engineered to have pastimes, ambitions, job skills, and dreams only be about rip and tear. Technologically superior space communists wanting to assimilate everyone in their quasi hierarchical communist empire and who take after Billy Mays. Humanoid wingless bird men cannibals who absorb trays from what they eat. Humanoid insects with claws capable of ripping through the toughest armor. Snooty and uncaring space elves that can read minds and who eat, sleep, and to have heterosexual sex in the missionary position in planet sized battle cruisers. Psychotic. Hedonistic space elves who routinely torture others to the point of death for sheer amusement before grinding their remains into refined cocaine. Fanatical zealots that knowingly devote themselves to all that is insane. Nightmare horrors made real who will rape and eat, usually simultaneously, any sentient being they get their go-tos on. Deformed, demented traitors clad in power armor and aided by the evilest forms of weaponry and sorcery ever conceived. Tracers who turn their backs on the Imperium and try to destroy it. Homicidal alien, lizard, insect, cyborg type monster pirates that horribly kill you for fun and who may be the puppets of an older and even more malignant civilization. Giant swarms of worms in cloaks who might be older than the old ones who are more sadistic than the dark elder and more manipulative than regular elder and feed on humans in the most disgusting and painful way imaginable hinted involves maggots. Massive insectoid hive mind filled to the brim with heavy firepower and has a slow but growing empire that is one of the largest in the galaxy, dwarfing the TAU several hundred times over and is seen as the next successor of galactic domination after humanity's potential fall. Humanoid rats that cause anything thing, living or not, to rapidly decay through touch. Malignant, omnipotent intelligence from beyond the cosmos, exerting all the power at their disposal to prevent any faction from breaking the stalemate or upsetting the dreadful status quo. And fuck knows who the guy in the cardboard box is. Without their faith in the emperor after his internment into the golden throne, the fragments of the Imperium would have fought against each other again like in the pre-Great Crusade days and subsequently devolved into what they were before the emperor revealed himself. So yes, much like Iral religion, it gives them hope and courage to fight on and survive in a universe that leaves the grimdark force it running every day and night. It's worth noting that good ol' MP wouldn't have had nearly as much of a problem with all this and wanted worship if he hadn't. Just as a quick example, insisted on wearing horrifyingly ornate solid gold armor and a big glowy halo at all times, or on carrying a flaming sword of righteousness, or on building continent-sized monuments to his vanity, or on decking all his personal troops and favored genetic experiments in as much bling as they could possibly carry, or on being 11 fucking feet tall or on creating a functional pantheon of genetically engineered demigods, one of whom looked like and was referred to as a little angel. If you look like Space Jesus and act like Space Jesus, people are going to take those observations to their extreme conclusions, like what Lorga did when he wrote the Lictitio Divinitatus. 
which can be summarized as ordinary men can't blow up suns and carry big glowy halos at all times, only a god can. Therefore the emperor is god. This is made even more relevant given that the fluff very strongly implies that the emperor was Jesus. That said, to Games Workshop's credit is being buttfucked by his own hubris and disregard for the humanity he claimed to be guiding in this manner was probably intentional as a classic tale of Greek tragedy. The possible death of the emperor. Badass and glorious. With the golden throne being consistently worn out, and the tech priest's two power armor on had rebooted to do anything about it, it is certainly possible that the emperor may die one day, which will obviously result in all of the imperial worlds and factions to cry tears of disappointment and subsequently devolve into chaos maybe even with a capital C. There are however, three possible outcomes of what can happen if the emperor eventually dies. The new eye of terror. Conventional wisdom and the elder says that in the event that the emperor dies, a new eye of terror will be created with terror at its center, plunging holy terror and all nearby planet systems into the warp. The current main rulebook says that all of reality will be plunged into the warp if the emperor dies. Even the Echel Shiaki agrees that if the Emperor were ever to die, humanity would be fucked at the barest minimum. This is supported by the fact that the Golden Throne itself a portal to the webway was broken by Magnus, causing a warp tear to open on Terra, which the Emperor has had to spend every second for the last 10,000 years concentrating on to keep from getting any bigger. Now the throne is also beginning to show signs of irreversible breakdown, but what happens if when, Big E dies is actually which of the two fails first? According to the old Earth novel. The Golden Throne has a Vulcan Forge device called Talisman of Seven Hammers that acts as a dead man's switch. It supposedly will destroy all of Terra if the throne finally kicks it. The Talisman has never been referred to in previous fluff, though the fullest implications of the throne failing have never been explored either. In any event, the death of the Emperor's physical body is theorized by some fans in the Elder in universe to have the potential to create a new Chaos God and a new Eye of Terror. Assuming that the warp rift the Emperor was keeping closed doesn't create a new Eye of Terror first. The effect of Vulcan's talisman is a wild card, as it was shown to have the capability to annihilate not merely banish a greater demon even before it was connected to the throne. And earlier in the same section the residual energy left over in the Emperor's full gearite was sufficient to make an army of bloodletters simply not be there any more. Connecting the talisman to the throne magnifies its power to the point that the Emperor believes it would not merely deny chaos their victory on terror, but can strike a blow against them the likes of which they will never recover from. Chaos may still get their warp rift, but may be burned badly by the Emperor's final fuck you. Regeneration. No, not the Doctor Who kind. The Horus Heresy novel Vulcan Lives heavily implies that the Emperor is a perpetual, just like John Grammaticus, Vulcan, all person. Olivia Eureka and Anvil Thorne, all of who were able to survive multiple deaths that completely obliterated their bodies in the process. So all he simply needs to do is for his current material body to die normally, and wait a couple of hours days and he'd be reborn again and the get up off the ground and dust himself off sense. As for the question of why he simply didn't wait to resurrect into a spanking new body before being interred in the throne. Refer to that giant warp tear in the webway project and the urgent need to keep it sealed at all times. All of this is still speculation done. Vulcan, for instance, was driven mad by the torturous experiences he had endured thanks to Night Haunter, and they were child's play, compared to sitting in unthinkable agony. Unable to move or speak for 10,000 years while feeling himself rotting away. And don't you forget that Nozich. However, a more commonly held belief is that he will get up, re-establish the Imperial Truth, and just be a cool guy. Too bad the Warp Rift and the Astronomicon don't have time to wait for him to do so. A whole faction of the Inquisition, Thorianism, exists to investigate the possibility of regeneration, looking for possible signs that the Emperor's consciousness can be transferred elsewhere, allowing him to walk among his children once more. That said, they don't know about the existence of perpetuals and would rather look for a new body to place the Emperor's soul into. That being said, this may be the best option if they can keep the Emperor powering the Astronomicon with one body while having his mind in a different body wandering around. Opponents to Thorianism generally see that encouraging this is a terrible idea, as having the Emperor rise in a physical form would only cause a schism in the Imperio, as many people would not believe it to be true. Having been ruled and brainwashed by the Echel Shiaki over thousands of years, which would lead to another major civil war. But think about it when Malkada took up the throne so that the Emperor could fight Horus, the device consumed his vitality, and Malkada was not as blessed as the Ents with Regan abilities to recover. Now imagine a weakened, crippled being, 
whose top priority immediately after killing his son is to stop the webway gate from spilling forth. You don't have time and nor does the galaxy to recover from your wounds. So you sit upon the throne and it consumes you slowly from that point onwards. The chair is stopping any sort of healing factor. This is supported by Path of Heaven. When Jagate Khan and the White Scars use the Dark Glass device to boogie woogie back to terror, much like Malkada, the one who uses the Dark Glass device is reduced to ashes just using it for a couple of moments. And the Dark Glass also has a throne unit to control it, though it is described as the Golden Throne's lesser cousin. The Golden Throne is described by the Chief Librarian using Dark Glass as far greater, immensely more powerful, older, fouler, Set deeper in the fabric of both reality and unreality so just what is the golden throne? From way above, we know it's a pain engine powerful enough to make a homunculus blush. Those using it need to be powerful sickers to actually control it, it consumes the souls of those who use it. Unless that person also has innate regenerative capabilities which, oh, let's see, leaves us with basically Emps or Magnus, and it exists both in reality and in the warp. The Emperor himself in Master of Mankind is evasive on where he found the core of the throne. Now imagine your Rogel Dawn on the Vengeful Spirit and Yav just found the bodies of Sanguinius and Horus and a dying Emperor. You race back to the palace because surely Malkada, the only person to even come close to knowing the Emperor should be able to help. Only to find him strapped to a machine that is literally turning him to dust. You have no idea what the hell this thing is because you're a good kid and keep out of dad's basement but your father tells you to strap him into the thing. You do it, even though Pops is weak and it just gamma the last guy to sit in it. Not a great situation but you do what dad says. Now he's stuck there, unable to regenerate but also unable to get up less demons invade that son dad left and the webway blows up. Fast forward 10,000 years, you're dead, and everyone is too stupid to realize it's a fucking pain engine and not a life support system. The Emperor was literally slapped into the equivalent of an infinite soul shriver while at his absolute weakest. If he could just stop sealing the webway gate while someone else Magnus took a pew, he could possibly stretch his legs out and be right as rain. So maybe, just maybe, the golden throne breaking down isn't a bad thing? Fuck. Age of the Emperor here we come. The Star Child. Although years of GW marketing and fluff upgrades have made the third claim rather dubious, many fat guys and optimists still hold out on the theory stating that when the Emperor screwed Horus's soul to the wall, part of the Emperor's soul was also cast into the wall. This soul fragment is called the Star Child, a god waiting to be reborn, or perhaps be reincarnated back into a human body anyone call for one scout Mkvena. If the remains of the Emperor were ever to die, the tiny spark of soul left in his body would reunite with the greater hole within the warp, and according to prophecy, force the four chaos gods into stalemate, while the races of the galaxy would be left to battle it out in one last great Ragnarok scenario called the End Times. This theory is tied closely to the Illuminati, a group of either supremely enlightened individuals or dangerous mutant heretics depending on which side of the Inquisition you're on. The Illuminati plan to catch all of the sensei and sacrifice them upon on the golden throne at the moment of emperor's death in a bizarre fusion of new and old fluff it has been revealed that the illuminati were a minor tsinch cult and the sensei were effectively brainwashed soon to be sacrifices in an attempt to bring tsinch to the materium needless to say they have been purged by the inquisition the fluff and the jack draco books reveal that the ordo hive are a small splinter faction of the illuminati who seek to turn humanity into a psychic hive mind is a tsinch cult but that the general Illuminati population, including many Ordomalius Inquisitors and the Exorcists chapter as well as their unknown successor chapters are genuinely incorruptible by chaos and are freely permitted to access the Black Library along with Harlequin Solitaires. Ultimately, all this would be rendered irrelevant as the Inquisition trilogy was ritzconned away. It's just like that frustrating moment you experience when you don't know if the squats have been nommed by tyrannids or have never existed in the first place. Beyond the Emperor edit, as stated in the Master of Mankind, the Emperor himself considers he already lost the game to save mankind from consuming itself into the warp while attempting to give the evolutionary jump. With the loss of the webway he seems to have concluded the only thing that remains is a long decline and there is nothing else to do but to wage an ever losing war. Or is it? The Emperor himself recognized he isn't omniscient. His foresight can't reach all. During recent years the writers of Games Workshop have been hinting at a few facts, 
let us consider the following. The future is not absolutely written, and this comes from chaos itself. Even Singe can't predict everything perfectly, requiring him to ask his insane bird oracle to clarify on these events. The fall of the Imperium may be inevitable, but mankind may live on. Given the sheer scope of the human exodus, it's perfectly likely that some remnant of the Dark Age of Technology has continued unchanged from its original height. The Cadian Pylons, while destroyed, were developed by beings that still exist. The fact the Necrons are still around opens the possibility that they may yet be capable of building replacements, and thanks to Trazin we know they are capable of closing of warp storms. Oh, and it seems like Uncle Call is working on that. The Akashic records truly exist and are somehow linked to Arc Mechanicus ships such as Speranza. This simple fact means all already existing knowledge is never lost forever, but merely incredibly hard to acquire. Creating humans immune to chaos is a reality. Both the exorcists and the grey knights are evidence to this. And while the process is excruciatingly slow, highly prone to failure and prohibitive in resources it means mankind can achieve through artificial means a sort of new evolutionary step. Not all elder died during the fall. Even if we are talking about 1% of the race it's still a great deal of individuals. And the fact they have managed to kickstart an anti-chaos god is something no one, not even the emperor managed to foresee assuming he did not know that is what the infinite circuits were for, which he no doubt did considering how old he is. Eldred has ultimately demonstrated there are other ways to fight chaos by being a dick. And thanks to Eldred waking in it up early if only barely, Robout Gilliman was awakened from stasis. Now he is preparing a new generation of super space marines along with some awesome new gear to help take down chaos. Plus some of the other loyalist primarchs are still out there and there is a possibility that they could return to help let the Imperium fight its many enemies. And for that matter, Eldred declared by the end of the War of the Beast that the futures of mankind and the Elder are irrevocably interlinked. Add to that the fact the Necrons too have given the Imperium a hand a few times and you suddenly notice there are more parties than the Emperor interested in not letting the human race fall. Despite the Imperium's hatred of Xenos, they may be mankind's best chance of survival. That said, we still do have to remember that both the Elder and Necrons want the Imperium and each other out of the way eventually in order to rebuild their empires. And the Imperium isn't keen on relying too heavily on the entities who will turn on them in a tip of the hat. On the other hand, desperate times call for desperate measures and who knows what the future could bring? Nobody saw the Tyranids coming because they hadn't even noticed the galaxy was inhabited until the whole mess with the Pharos device. Not the Chaos Gods, not the Emperor, not the Elder the Warrican saw them coming. And the Tyranids are both an outside context issue for the galaxy being the only faction with galactic pull that is completely and unambiguously disconnected from the war in heaven or the Horus. Heresy that serves as everyone else's origin stories ties and a wild card in the fate of the galaxy. Finally, there is humanity itself. While he failed to take into account the fact that humanity is a mass of individuals rather than an abstraction, he also underestimated how this could work for good as well as evil. For every traitor and heretic, there is an equally devoted believer in the inherent goodness of mankind willing to stand against the ruinous powers, and it is on the individual level that the struggle between the ruinous powers and humanity is ultimately fought and decided upon. And one last thing, there is a chance that if the emperor dies, he might just resurrect or incarnate and in it is still out there so he might still have a second chance. This is further aided by the fact we don't know how quickly he would resurrect himself, being a perpetual. If it is quick enough or if he remains potent while his soul is in the warp until he revives, he can probably prevent or perhaps even close the Terran warp rift. Then he's back in the game ready to put his powered armor on and kick ass. But then again, that's a huge gamble. We're talking about regenerating over 10,000 years of wounds and trauma on a being more powerful than any human documented. If it took too long, Terra falls and the rest of the Imperium would be rendered effectively maimed and crippled with the loss of the Astronomicon. Dashing any hope the Emperor could have at salvaging the Imperio. Yes, the Emperor failed to avoid mankind's inherent flaws to hinder his great work ironically, because he was guilty of several of them as well. But he also failed to see a lot of the good things mankind can bring in. In yet another twist of irony, his incapability to predict us may even thwart his own prediction of humanity's doom. Indeed, this is Warhammer 40,000, a cautionary tale about the end of empires, but so was Warhammer Fantasy Battle, and, although we won't like the AOSification of the setting, there may still be more than just a complete failure for the future of mankind and the Emperor. 
so yeah, this was actually supposed to be all one video, but as I said before, had some technical issues, but like, you know, that's neither here nor there. Anyway, um, though for me, I'm a big fan. I really do buy into the Emperor being able to be reborn. Um, the only problem is, as I went over with um, the warp lift and all that shit, can't like you know with the Terran Terra apart because you also you're not just losing Terra you will lose Marge like you know so fuck you the uh, the Mechanicus might as well be gone as well with that you know um there's a lot of damage like you know same with the um, the Grey Knights on Titan you know there's a lot of shit in that in well our sector I suppose that um, could go and if we lose that you know, the Imperium's gone, but can humanity even survive? You don't know. But, uh, like, I think there is a lot of hope with Gullyman. Um, I used to be one of those people, I used to hate Gullyman. I really didn't like him at all. I just thought, uh, old means faggots, all that type of shit. But, like, I'm, I'm really enjoying him, and I really love his moments where, I am the Senate! Like, you know, that he does, he fucking has moments where he's just like, nah, I'm doing, I'm doing shit my way. Fuck yous. Like, you know, he really could not give less of a fuck. And I, and I love that. Like, you know, he's not what, he, he almost feels like a very, very different character than what he was before, what he was written about before. To me, I don't know, I, I really enjoy Gulliman. And with the whole you need shit with the Eldar, um, there's a lot of hope. Like, you know, I never thought, like, you know, 40k could have like a hopeful outcome you know it's so weird to think of like you know i think it's great though i'm I'm really enjoying where the story is going at the minute i know there's a lot of people out there that hate it and they just think it's um he just sigmarized and you know whatever but like, i don't know i i think it's pretty cool so far I, I i i haven't came across anything that i think oh that's that's fucking horrible i hate that i don't want that you know what i mean um, but, like, as always, like, let us know what you think down below, and, uh, like, you know, as I said this before, go on 1D4 Chan, if you haven't already, go ahead, get lost in the articles, if you yourself do use 1D4 Chan, you know, I use it all the time, but if you've came across any articles that you think deserve some serious attention, that, like, you know, um, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say no, I would love to do it as a video, I love 1D4 Chan, I think the more people that use it, the better, because, um, some of the articles do need updating, uh, and there's only, you know, it's all community generated, so, like, you know, definitely go on, and if you see anything, try and give them a hand where you can, you know what I mean? But, look, uh, before you do that, also remember to, like, and subscribe, and all that other good stuff, and, look, I'm, I'm been babbling for too long, so, look, I'll talk to you in a wee bit, alright? Oh! Yeah, this is the shit! Kill me now! Ugh. Two foot of pink, one foot of stink, baby! Two foot of pink, one foot of stink! You can switch it around if you want, if you're a real man! Ah! Yeah!